Reginald de la Forge was a planter, and the son of a planter. Given that the senior Reginald had passed in 57, the Confederate provost saw best to leave the junior mind in our property. The irony of this was that Uncle Reggie had spent the years of his youth establishing himself among all the folks in the county as the strongest, the quickest, and the best of shots. Agriculture was of no concern to the young man whose three younger brothers all left home for battle. The wood on our property, the very wood where I played free in some of my earliest memories was cleared by government decree in the fall of 64 in the name of cannon wheels and wagon axles and railroad ties. This was a chore made all the more difficult by the fact that the Confederate cavalry had already conscripted the entire stable of horses for service as mounts. Four years on, with every slave once owned escaped in the dead of several nights, Reggie was just as lonely and as labored as this country's first pioneering de la Forge. That pioneer was left long since lying beside his beloved wife, and they could offer their descendant no advice beyond the establishment of the imperial boneyard into which Reggie had already passed twice in casket procession. Then the straw that came to break his back was a pine box from the failure of Petersburg, returning Augustus, the youngest brother. It was March of 1865 when Uncle Reggie left the farm. He took a long telescope rifle into the hills, he made his encampment over a thin mountain pass through which the Union regiments were funneled. Son, and I'm sorry for the discomfort that I'm sure it must be causing you. Tell me, how many more men are coming over this mountain? <laughs> One had hoped their death a sight more dignified than this, I'm sure. I can oblige you, such. Just tell me, how many more men do your drunken generals plan to send my way? <laughs> miss, but I must inquire. You actually know what you are doing? I only ask because that was the third time we crossed this river, and the further we get down the mountain, the deeper it seems to get. I'm taking you back to the lines. Of course you are. But I'm obliged to tell you that if you intend to cross this river again, that I did not cross it once on my own ascent. The army's on the other side of the mountain from your bunch. Are they on three other sides of the mountain, or the three other sides of the river? Are you ready? This is a hospitable thing. That's the problem with being a gentleman in war. The sensible thing to do would be to attack you right now. Bludgeon you upside the head. Choke you to death. 
escape. That would be the sensible thing. But ungentlemanly. So manners dictate that I must allow you to lead me to my death. We're not going to die. I know what the Yankee lines means for me. I'm a nurse, and I can tell you I've treated both blues and captured greys. Help them heal or help them to the other side, regardless what color their jacket. What exactly do you think getting to the Union line means? I don't doubt that you treated greys. How many of them were irregular, though? I know what happens when they get their mitts on irregulars. We ain't protected by no prisoner agreement. Something peculiar about being led to my death by one of God's angels. Thought this might be of interest to you. Straight down the hill, then. As the crow flies. I have to ask, sister. Why did you come up here, up this mountain? To catch you? To bring you back? On your own volition, was it? I prayed on it. I prayed to our Lord, and when his answer came, it did not come from Christ the Redeemer. The answer came from Christ the Judge. Yeah. Is he the one who sent you? The Lord Almighty, his own self? He gave me the strength. Gave you the strength, absolutely. But the order? I mean, you climbing this hill, coming all this way? Did he tell you to do that? Or how did you get here exactly? I left camp with those two men you killed. They were rangers guiding me to the ridge. You come up with the rangers. How'd you get hooked up with them? I assume Jesus didn't give them, do you? Or were they in fact angels? They knew the pass. And the captain thought you may not fire on a nun's party. The captain. Captain Stewart. Of the Union. Of Pennsylvania. So you come commissioned. Under orders. Sent up to kill some sharpshooter. Might as well be a ranger yourself is what you're telling me. I am a nurse. I care for soldiers. You're the one who kills them. I am. I absolutely am. And so Uncle Reggie continued to empty his rifle until it fell into a state of disrepair. The papers attributed to him the death of 54 northern soldiers. Reggie then retired to the life of a farmer and spoke of the war only on rare occasions, and never of the Sister of Mercy whose name he never knew. But the land was not as bountiful as it once had been. It provided him only enough to support himself, and even that was just barely. He never took a wife, he never hired help, he only worked. Uncle Reggie, Amos wants to talk to you. He brought his whole gang of red shirts too. I told them you weren't interested, but they aren't taking my answer. I want to talk to you personally. You should understand our struggle better than anyone. Maybe I should. Lord knows I got no friends at the Freedmen's Bureau. <laughs> Hell nah! Goddamn Republicans running us into the ground every chance they get. We've got a mind to do something about it. We sure could use the help of Mr. Dele Forge 54. A man should look after his own troubles. 
instead of going to start more. None of us is out here on our own. And if you ain't with us... I ain't. And if you'd like to discuss this further, Amos? Why don't you come up here and discuss it? I never told anyone about it before. I ain't really fixing to again. Let them boys in town go on about their 54 business. This ain't a lot of talk and ain't doing any good. Nothing to brag about, Sister of Mercy or anyone else. 18 men for every lost brother, they say. They do say. Doesn't empty any graves, so. How do you feel about it all? I don't. 